In today's episode, we sit down with Ben Durin, the architect behind designing and building this 12,000 square foot super home in the north of England. This is one of the most beautiful homes Rosie and I have ever seen. And in this conversation, Ben shares exactly what it takes to design and deliver a home to the highest standard. I hope you enjoy. So the original brief was to have a forever house. As soon as you start with a project of this scale, on site you realise that it's going to take you longer and it's going to be harder than you, 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 you ever envisaged. I think scenes believing with this house, whoever you are, whether you do or you don't like the finish of this house, I don't believe anybody would walk into this house and not buy, be impressed by the size of the ceilings or you know the, the views that you have in the property and around the property along the pool. So then we're well felt here today at this beautiful property that you've been see a huge part of the, the design and build process i mean just to set the scene where are we what is this property so we are in Lytham st Anne's, uh in the northwest of the uk and this property is a bespoke meticulously executed home for my clients and I've been fortunate enough to uh, work on this project for the last couple of years and see this through to completion. So how long has it taken? The initial um, inception for the design was in January 2019. Uh, so um, we had to get it through planning initially. This house is a lot bigger than the house that was on the plot previously. Uh, so when we uh, commenced construction uh, in September 2019, it was fully completed by May 2022. So approximately uh, two and a half years. Um, and the rationale behind the length of time really is we had COVID hit us halfway through, which didn't necessarily stop us from working, but just trying to secure materials was just very difficult uh, but in addition to that the actual finishing of the inside of the house uh, took far longer than we anticipated initially just because of the size of the house but also in order to achieve the level of detail we wanted things really do take quite a bit longer however it's been worth the wait I believe and was this the first project that you did with this client or have you done with several before that led to finalizing sort of the perfect design on this property? I, yeah, I think I've worked with uh, the owner several years prior. The owner's a developer and I think that the previous relationship we built up really came to fruition when we started building this house. And I think because we sing from the same hymn sheet, and when we started designing the house, we just collaborated instantly from the start. So I had the vision of how things should look and he knew what he wanted in the house. And, you know, it wasn't right every single time. There was certain walls that were moved when he wanted rooms bigger and things like that. But the fact that we were able to be on site with the client managing the project enabled us to ensure that the finished product was exactly what he wanted. What was the original brief that you were given by the client? And then what was your initial vision? How's it evolved? So the original brief was to have a forever house. One that they didn't have to ever have to worry about climbing stairs or, or maintaining like what a normal house. Uh, so we designed it all, all on one level and maximized the use and the orientation of the plot uh, to just achieve the best um property and the best vistas when entering the property uh, and the brief fundamentally was large rooms high ceilings open plan living so your vision then i mean i'm just this is very unique obviously for for this location but also for just the uk architecture in general it seems like there's a lot of over inspiration from overseas and yeah but so i mean where where have you and the client kind of drawn inspiration from so just various different um properties all around the world i mean 
fundamentally the clients wanted this home to feel like a summer home throughout the year so no matter what time of the year whether it's uh, snowing or it's sunny uh, it would still feel like a summer property with the with the cladding that we've chosen for instance and the way the light enters the back of the property underneath the canopy and the different shadows that are cast inside and outside the property uh, so I think yeah that's the fundamental aspect of just being able to have a home that would ensure they can live in for the rest of their lives and they wouldn't have any regrets when they when they complete the build what's what's your favorite part of the house where is he um mine is not necessarily part of the house but just the build quality i haven't been in a house ever i don't think that's got a build quality as high as this one i've been like going around looking at all the corners all the i'm talking about to the owner about the skirting and how he used the architraves from the door to finish the skirt in detail i mean if you guys are what are listening on audio only i recommend watching the video to this podcast because we're going to be overlaying a load of b-roll clips to really show quality but one thing i was going to ask before we get into too much of the technical detail was was there anything about the delivery of this home from a technical perspective i know you mentioned before it's a steel frame but you know was there anything that was technically challenging on the delivery of this um as soon as you start with a project of this scale on site you realize that it's going to take you longer and it's going to be harder than you, 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 you ever envisaged um just the size of the property and the simple fact that the plant room where we located all the services uh we strategically located it side of the drive so when the client's on holiday the pool company the electricians anyone could come around and service the house while they were on holiday so nobody has to come in the house but this means that that plant room is best part of 40 meters away from the other side of the house. So, so then you think, well, every single light switch in the house has got its own IP. Every single Igazini light has got its own IP. So um, each one having their own address needs its own wire. So you can imagine sending a cable just for that one light all the way from the plant room up through steel down through walls there's 40 kilometers of cables in the house you know so cat six data cables every light has power and it has data so i would say the most challenging part of the build uh, was just delivering the electrical audio visual just to ensure that the house functions properly and one thing we've everyone's commented on is the lighting design and the general m e within the building is that something you guys did collaboratively looking at you know the lighting around the house or did you bring in you know is that something that was consulted on specifically no i have absolutely no lighting design training whatsoever but i know what looks good and i know that with good lighting you can make a good design look bad and a bad design look good so my biggest fear with this property from day one is just being a failure. I just was adamant that it had to be a success. So everything that we did just had to follow through with that. So the lighting, you know, the task lighting and the accent lighting and the different moods and the different zones in each room uh, just simply created from a vision, really, presented to the client and the electricians, and uh, off they went. So can you, that t so I've never seen these lights before and we'll try and show up with cameras somehow, but obviously as you look at them, you can see the light, of course, but only then when you move directly underneath and look up how glare of the way out. Yeah, so from some angles, you can't even see them on. They, they don't look, you can see the light on the walls and the floor, but it just looks like a, a slim black strip. And the... These lights in particular are Igazini laser blades and they're plastered in finish. So there's no trim around the lights. Uh, there's no circular spotlights anywhere in the house. That was an absolute cardinal sin from the client is I'm not having any cheap spotlights anywhere in the house. So they invested in the Igazini lights um, because one of the things, as you know, is the lighting is just so often overlooked in homes and properties but we knew that 
it had to be absolutely perfect and the only lights that we could think of that were had followed the modern design and gave us the effect we wanted to achieve were the Igazinis. So they are like lasers almost, aren't they? It's like when you're looking at like a laser pen, yeah. you can see the light, but then it's only when you try and the laser pen in your eye. Well, so. <laughs> it it is. Is. Um, but it's, it's not just the actual light that fixtures themselves, it's the placement of the lights and yeah. the attention to, to symmetry as well, especially yeah. over the pool table and, uh, and everywhere. I mean, the symmetry in this property alone is... Yeah. Who's OCD yeah, with like, that? <laughs> is that you or the client? We both are. Yeah, we, we were nicknamed certain things because we were just obsessed with symmetry. But um, symmetry is it's just all about balance, isn't it? creating the correct balance and with symmetry if it's perfect you don't really notice it but if it's not perfect then it you do notice it and it stands out and i think that's the one thing about this house is that nothing nothing jumps out as being incorrect because there's been an emphasis around symmetry and and things lining up plug sockets light switches speakers from the ceiling to the tile joints lining up perfectly to the millimetre because you know between myself and the clients we we're obsessed with detail and, and symmetry talk, talk to me what you told me about the the hallway just in front of us here about the tiles and how you have to move the walls to line it up mm -hmm. yeah so obviously we started designing the house and there was no thought whatsoever into what size tiles you know we were going to you just when you're designing a steel frame and a hallway, you, you don't usually think about what tiles you're going to use. So we got to the point where the concrete walls were built, the roof was on, we were specifying the tiles, and we established that where the concrete walls were in line with the steel columns, it would mean that there'd be a, um, a hundred mil slither cut of tile along the corridor, and that to me is just absolutely unacceptable. It's, it's, it looks like a complete afterthought. So we actually built stud walls in front of the concrete walls to ensure that they were set out perfectly to the millimetre of where the edge of the tower would be. So when you walk into the front door, you have three perfectly spaced tiles all the way through the hallway. And that then shoots off to the left and the right and everywhere else and the, the symmetry follows. To the point we got so obsessed with it, we'd set out for the front door, um, the large pivot door, and we realised that we were going to overshoot a tile because obviously the door was set out before we knew the tiles. So we actually reconstructed the whole entranceway to ensure that the door was moved 200 mil inwards so that it would be at the edge of a full tile. So you would, see, when you walk in a property, you'd see full tiles all the way so you wouldn't see any small cuts because the cuts just look like an afterthought so the level of detail even having to change things just to ensure it was executed perfectly i think those are the reasons that they keep you awake at night and give you headaches and the project overrun and yeah but but the fact that the client's plan from the start was to live in their property he'd rather have it run over by a couple of months than it not be absolutely perfect. In terms of sort of like neighbour procurement, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you can't get good tilers, you can't get good whatever. Was that, do you already have a good established, you know, contact list of trades or, you know, was there situations with this property where things had to be redone to hit that quality level? I have a good list of trades now, having completed this property. Any project that you start on, doesn't matter, you know, what size the project, you always will have issues with trays and other professionals. There's always, you know, people letting you down. But the ones that come through are the, are the ones that you keep hold of and the ones that are dedicated to deliver perfection, basically. And I think towards the finishing of this project, the contractors on site all had aligned goals and that was just if you're on this site you, you you're not leaving unless it's perfect and when everybody established that is the level 
of specificate the level of finish that we demand then it suddenly actually becomes a little bit easier because everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet but the moment you think that you're going to go and do a job bish bosh bosh and you're in you're out it's never going to happen on on a job like this sure and one really interesting feature that the owner was uh, pointing out to us earlier is the um, ceiling detail above the pool. Could you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, so the stretch ceiling. It's really interesting, the stretch ceiling. So they build all the the framework for the coffered stretch ceiling. So the central part is higher, and then there's an LED in the perimeter, uh, which casts a glow on the higher part. And then there's the lower part, which is almost looks like a plastered ceiling, but it's not. The whole ceiling's fabric. So you build the structure, you close all the doors and windows, you get it airtight, you heat the room up substantially to the point that you, you can hardly breathe in there. And this relaxes the fabric for the ceiling. So the fabric is then stretched. What is the fabric, sorry, like a... So it's, it's almost like a, uh, it's just like a synthetic material. Um, but when it's when it's stretched over the frame and it's in position, the room then cools down to normal room temperature. The fabric then tightens and forms this perfectly flat finish. So you'd stand and you'd look at the, the coffer, the lowered walkway, for instance, and it looks like a perfectly sprayed finish white ceiling. But if you were to reach up and touch it, although you can't because it's so high, if you did, it would actually push in. It's a fabric. Um, so for the environment in the swimming pool, the high humidity, the uh, the heat, the water, the splashing, it's just absolutely perfect. So we use a plain white for the perimeter, but we use a gloss grey in the centre and uh, because of the air movements in the pool room there's actually a very slight movement in the ceiling but it it just adds to the experience of of being in the property well i initially at first thought it was the water That's reflecting heavy. off when you look at the water the water's completely still yeah um it's really yeah, i thought it was like itch. i thought like, uh, well i asked i said is that resin because I, I couldn't yeah. at first see what that finish was and yeah he said it was a stretch ceiling which is incredible the most unique thing about it is the pool is 25 metres long and the ceiling follows the shape of the pool and that is all one piece. There's no cuts because the, if you see, you would see a cut, you'd see a joint a mile off. So they have one roll pre-cut off site with the edging stitched in. It's brought to site very, very carefully, stretched out, heated up and installed bit by bit. So it's an absolute um, mission of a project to do, but if it's done, if it's executed correctly, it just looks absolutely fantastic. Can you give us an idea of how much that kind of costs, that process? Well, for, I'm not sure per square metre, but I mean, you wouldn't get much change from 50,000 just for the stretch ceiling. Because the, the time that goes into, you know, and the knowledge and experience you have to have to be able to do it perfectly because if you don't get it perfectly or you cut any aspect of it with a knife by accident the whole thing needs to be replaced so that's the whole sheet for the full ceiling you know so it takes many years of and want to be the fitter yeah exactly exactly and, and there's several people in there fitting it so it takes several years of experience and perfecting the craft in order to do it properly yeah i mean it looks breathtaking when you actually look at it it's got that like you say the slight movement to it it's amazing um one thing i picked up on in this property lot is the mixture in textures and sort of tones again whose interior choice was that you know we've got quite a lot of is it a venetian plaster that we have here yeah so <clears throat> as with everything in this property um i, I had an idea with the client uh, that he should do they should do a couple of feature walls in Venetian. Uh, one was in the main lounge, one was in the front lounge. Couple of walls. So I got some samples ready, uh, brought the samples around, and they just thought, I want that in my whole house. So we established, actually, you can have it everywhere. You can have the whites on the ceilings and the walls, and anyway, if you want a 
a wall that looks plain white but then it, when you get close up it's got different textures from the trowel uh, so this house doesn't have any painting it doesn't have any conventional plaster skin finish with paint it's every single wall and finish in the house is is venetian because it it brings so much to the room and it just adds to that experience so every aspect of the property we wanted to just have as an experience so that you are getting value for money so as the homeowner investing working hard all your life and investing your hard-earned money into this property you want to be able to come home every day and be glad that you spent every last penny because you appreciate the finish i, th I think that's one when I just saw the photos, this is my first time here, Tyler's second, when I first saw the photos, I was like, wow, it's almost like, you know, one of those properties you see abroad, looks like a work of art. And one thing I've always felt about some of these properties is they're a bit cold, almost unhomely. Whereas as soon as I walked into here, that was the first thing I said, no, it feels homely. And at first I was like, what is it? The rooms aren't quite as big as, you know, they're not like oversized. They're like, they, they feel big, but intimate. Like, what was it? And then I, I clocked, I was like, I think it's the, plaster because it gives that like it's the texture and the warmth to the room that you know a lot of people would dare I say make the mistake of just doing a white or an off-white wall that's very flat and it just gives that it's a cold finish almost which mm. I think detracts a lot of people from this sort of style of living because they think oh it doesn't feel doesn't feel like home whereas I mean yeah first I think this property feels amazing I think scenes believing with this house. I mean, you can see any pictures, videos, and it, some may like it, some may not like it. If you, whoever you are, whether you do or you don't like the finish of this house, I don't believe anybody would walk to this house and not buy, be impressed by the size of the ceilings or, you know, the, the views that you have in the property and around the property, along the pool. Um, and but I absolutely agree the the Venetian plaster not only adds that depth and texture but it's all lime based so looking into actually what the product is lime based plasters are not very common these days we used them hundreds of years ago but they breathe they and they allow the building to breathe as daft as it sounds if you've been cooking a curry for instance you know the smells can be neutralized by lime plaster Whereas they can sit on a plaster skin wall for weeks and weeks with the lime based Venetian, it can actually help neutralize that. So it just keeps the environment within the property pretty neutral all the time. I never heard of that before. That was something else. I mean, there's not many people that do Venetian plaster, but we found a company in particular, a person that is probably the best in the world at Venetian, applying Venetian plaster. The creativity, I mean, he's the only person uh, that goes back to Sheikh Mohammed's palace every couple of years to touch up his his um, his gold leaf walls and things. He's the only person to have that. So it's because he's so good at what he does, you know, he's so passionate that we wanted to work with him on the whole property. So he had a team around him, but he oversaw everything. And so that level of detail of finishing every single room had to be absolutely perfect before it was signed off so furniture couldn't go in TVs couldn't go the, all the Venetian pl plaster had to be perfect talk us through that I mean the glass you know, just staring at this room I'm sure the guys can see behind us on camera like these two walls is pretty much just like glass yeah I know and it's an absolute headache for the, the company to install the speakers and tune in the room because it's the, the hardest thing to get the best acoustics in a room full of glass. Um, but that's another story, you know. With the glass, this evolved as well. You know, we, we, we knew the how the property was going to look. So we looked into various companies and various products from a variety of price ranges. And from the start, I always wanted to use a frameless system. I didn't want to see a frame wanted silicon joints to the glass. They had to be 10 millimeters. That was the exact specification. And um, the wall, there's two panes of glass behind you, for instance, and they're both three quarters of a ton each. So you can imagine trying to maneuver one single piece of glass three quarters of a ton into position. 
Um, but the interesting thing is I presented the different choices and costs to the client and we went to see different companies and so so they could make an informed decision. Uh, the company that we went with, uh, they just deal with the whole package, the design and the install. And if there's ever an issue, there's one person to contact and nothing is too small or too big an issue. For instance, I walked in this room once and the the gap between the uh, silicon jointed gap was bigger. So you've got two pieces of glass and the, inside the glass they've got a black strip. So the black strip on one of the pieces was about 5 mil bigger than the one on the right. So I could see that symmetry wasn't perfect. I just phoned the owner of the company and within 10 minutes the machine was out pulled the glass out, changed it, and he's basically just flipped the glass round. Yeah. You know, the, tran the, the transom strip was on the wrong side. It was just a simple mistake. But be I noticed it, and they changed it in time, but it wasn't it wasn't a drama. You know, many, pe many companies would have just fobbed me off or given me the tolerance, yeah. you know, absolute hate that rule. But they would have done, but they didn't. The fact is, the level of company that we commissioned are you to delivering high-end luxury property glazing packages with the expectation that comes with, alongside that with the expectation that the client is paying for the best so they expect the best finish so it's a perfect example of something that wasn't quite right but it was rectified instantly by using the correct people and in terms of your delivery method here it wasn't a fixed price so you so you weren't you were the project manager and this property, yeah. subcontracted to whichever packages, but you did it on a cost plus basis rather than a... So no, so actually on this property, we just did a, a management contract. Okay. So uh, the client was principal contractor and um, he employed me effectively to design and manage the whole build. Um, and then as things got busier and there's more trades on site, the client appointed uh, a site manager, someone that we were both familiar working with. So they were here every day. They were just overseeing all aspects of the bill, just making sure that more than anything, the health and safety is absolute. Because you can imagine 30, 40 people running around on site trying to do the job towards the end of projects. It's, it can be you know quite hazardous if the health and safety is not on. So uh, on this project, I was project managing uh, but I was in a position to stand back and let the site manager manage each trade while I could oversee the finish and the quality. So it worked perfectly, really, working in collaboration with the client who would also make daily site visits as well. And do you believe a project can be delivered to this quality with a contractor on a fixed price? No, absolutely not. It's conflict of interest. Because they're going to try and get the cheapest price? The contractor puts a price in to win a job. The contractor has a profit margin and a contingency to protect. That conflicts with a client's desire to achieve perfection. Because if you ask a contractor to redo something because it's not perfect, they will find any reason not to do that because it's costing them money. And the more time they have to spend redoing anything, the more their profit margin goes down. So towards an end of a project like this, a contractor would be an absolute negative profit. So that you, you cannot have um, one contracting company do this, but what you can do, you can have a management contract, such as what I do now on other new builds, where you have it on a cost plus. So I'm responsible for the whole project. I'm in effect the designer and the builder, and I have my own site manager who delivers to the same level of um, finish that I expect and oversees everything. So that is the one package. But that is one main thing that I learned on this job is you can't employ um, one company to do everything unless it's the company that I've established, management and subcontracting all the specific trades that are the best at what they do on an open book cost plus basis exactly yeah otherwise you're right there is i never thought of it actually in that sense that it's a conflict of interest 
Well, I mean, I guess from our, our perspective as developers, where we do have to be more commercially minded, and we yeah. if we're delivering a team, we've got a profit margin to hit. For us, it's finding that balance where we maybe part of the tender process or putting that tender pack together. You know, we we spec something mm-hmm. we definitely want, and then leave the rest for the contractor. But the beauty of a scheme like this is that. It was almost free reign, almost, and yeah, and it wasn't a profit. It was the developers' yeah. Yeah. forever home. It, exactly, it wasn't about. There was no, um, there was no company protecting a massive profit margin because the client on this project is a developer, and this house was for himself. We handpicked each trade, so we went with the best people at what they did. The the high, most highly skilled people that we could appoint worked on this project but there was no contractor on this project that was protecting a massive profit margin and that's that's one of the reasons why we've been able to facilitate such a high quality finish if you have um, a project where you need to tender then you can put in your tender documents to be delivered with zero defects and you can put all this stuff in but if push comes to shove a contractor doesn't want to do something they'll find a reason not to do it and one of the absolute worst you know catch-all is the tolerance you know it's within a tolerance if it's not millimeter perfect it's not right in my eyes and and the client on this property shared that view from the start so it has to be millimeter perfect otherwise it's not satisfactory but you can't achieve that for, with somebody on a fixed price no no they, they just wouldn't make a profit mm-hmm. simply no because they'd be they'd be what they perceive as being perfect is um is is not is not always is always correct i literally had so many sleepless nights on this job to the point that at one point I thought I was like having a serious brain injury it was like their constant head it's constant neurofen what, 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 but from triggered from what? From just dealing with trades people? Just because I had this vision of this perfection, basically, and everything being perfect. And if it wasn't, it just used to keep me awake at night because I, I knew I couldn't be here every second of the day. Um, And it's just, it taught me a lot. This is how I've evolved into doing the cost plus myself is having a permanent site manager that is singing from the same hymn sheet. Work f- full time employed by me with the, you know, the brief of is perfection or nothing, you know. And there's not many people used to working like that. No, definitely not. That's the curse of the artist as well, isn't it? That, that pressure. On your shoulders and yeah it, it's it, it was quite it was a lot i mean my eyes still twitching now i don't know where you can see doesn't it doesn't sound like the pressure stemmed necessarily from the the client no that was the best thing but it's more the pressure of just yourself with doing a delivering a project with your name attached to it well it's also to know that actually you can't hide behind anything as anyone working on this site usually contractors will do something if if we can get away with it you know you couldn't do that on this site it got picked up whenever that happened we, it seldom happened but the client being ultra anal himself would notice everything you know the eye for detail anything that just that stood out from not not being level or just not being lined up properly it just stood out a mile what was it you told me about some of the tiles? I think you laid some tiles and had to rip them back up again because they were out. That was in the kitchen. The grout lines didn't line up perfectly with outside, so they came up. And the tiles outside had to match the tiles yeah. inside. So the tiles outside, the grout lines just line up per- perfectly. So when you come into the property, that grout line runs all the way to the exterior inside to out and if and if any of that deviates off track it's you'd notice that instantly then suddenly suddenly your experience isn't how it should be because you notice that fault 
just like if you were to buy a new car and there was a slight a slight indentation or defect with the paint, you'd notice it, wouldn't you? It's a brand new car. And it's the same with this house. And you walk into the front door, the slightest thing that isn't absolutely perfect jumps out. Is that value for money, like you said? I know before we started this, we were talking about uh, they've got a decked on cladding system here, which is unbelievably expensive. But it, it's like you're saying, well, when you spend this much money, to then have something not free ride, yeah. it's like you wasted the money to walk in and the grout line be off. It's like all that effort to change in the wall to be three tiles wide just for a grout line to be off. It's like... I think if somebody said to me it's expensive, I'd just say define expensive. What's it, you know, because there's, there's a difference between expensive, not getting value for money, but there's a false economy as well. So if you pay a hundred thousand pounds for a certain cladding system or tile or plastered wall, and you have to redo that in 10 years time, and it costs you 200 grand when you do it then, so you're in 300,000. If you do it properly and use the right product done pr correctly from the start with the right people, but it costs you 400,000 pounds, wouldn't you rather get value for money, do it properly and enjoy the products that you want from the start than having the concern and the regret that you didn't go with the product that you wanted or having a concern that you'd have to change it in 10, 20 years' time. And the products that we looked at, for, clad in the building, for instance, you know, you, we could have easily spent a fraction of the price. They wouldn't, A, they wouldn't have looked as good. Um, B, they wouldn't have lasted. And C, because they're not as good products, the installers that are used to installing that product are also also not as good and they're not as particular. But you go to that high end level of the product that looks the best and is the best. It then attracts the um, fitters that are then used to fitting that high end product. Okay, my last question on the property before we talk about everything else going on in your business. The furnishings, was that interior? design as part of it or did the client do it themselves because even the soft furnishings everything are beautiful the the clients um the clients you know the finishing the textures and the uh palettes were basically to keep it as simple as possible really uh but in certain rooms just have certain contrasting colors and contrasting materials but nothing that would detract you away from um, the experience of being in a large room, say, or the view outside. So only enhancing finishes and enhancing materials to enhance the surroundings. But it wasn't done by an external professional company. That was again all done within the. It was. It was done. It was done with the with the clients and um, and the consultant that she she works with. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It looks. It, well. Yeah, every detail down to the coffee tables is just perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to get carried away and, and go over the top, and I think that it's so crucial in, in design is less is more, and simple is the art of sophistication, as the quote goes, but it really is just trying to stick to that because it is easy to get carried away. We're just keeping a simple material palette, simple materials, um, how, for instance, the plastered in speakers. There's no big speakers. There are a lot big speakers in the in the television wall in the front room. You do not know they're there because they're plastered in. Well, you could see video explain that so that I still can't wrap my head around the fact that the speakers are behind the plastered wall. Yeah. So the speakers um, are built into the wall. They're wired. They're tested. They function correctly. But they are of such good quality, they don't need replacing in 10 years. They don't need maintaining. They are plas They are built into the wall. They have a cover, a cover uh, with a fine mesh, but you can plaster onto that cover. So when you touch the wall, the wall is hard. You would not know touching the wall, but you look at the wall, simple Venetian plastered wall, but be within the wall, behind that Venetian, is a one metre high speaker and they're both in in the walls in in the living room in the front room and they cost an absolute fortune and there's not many people have ever done it 
because they're so expensive. But on this project, it goes back to the client just wanting the best and not having any regrets. Because that is the key thing. You've worked hard all your life. You want the house of your dreams. Don't have any regrets. Just go for the product you want. The money's not the issue. You've got the money there. So why wouldn't you why wouldn't you specify the item or the material that you want? Yeah. And and for this I mean, I love my audio, love my music. And the other thing as well, which I'm one of my favourite features is in the fire pit at the bottom with the speakers that you have in kind of the hedge row surrounding that. One that's pretty incredible just how kind of hidden they are, but the actual sound quality and how yeah. engineered it is so when you're sat in that particular location even though you're outside it does sound like you're in a cinema yeah almost and i mean what was what was the process of designing so, that as with everything with this house you know there was there was a budget for speakers and audio visual and we restricted it to maybe to the front room initially and then actually, why would we just have it in the front room? We'll have it in the bedroom, we'll have it in the pool, we'll have it in the kitchen. The kitchen open plan living area is vast. And and the time that was invested into tuning and channeling every speaker so the, there weren't echoes and this, it sounded perfectly from wherever you were stood um, was just phenomenal. And And that is also carried on outside. Under the soffit, she's sitting and having a, a barbecue. It sounds just as good outside as when you stood inside. So you're not. So you you feel like you're still in the property even when you're out of the property. And you go into the fire pit, and you have the uh, the subwoofers and the external speakers surrounding the fire pit, but they're all precision placed and precision tuned. So when you go walk down into the fire pit, it sounds equally as good down there, if not better, than when you're actually in the house. So that you can have your music on in the house, you can walk any anywhere around the house, and it and it, the music sounds just as good wherever you are. So it's like a, just an, an immersive experience. And I think the thing is, when you're here, it's the first time you guys have been here, and the first, when you're here, you could be anywhere in the world. The gate closes. It's you've got a forest to the back golf course. The the fences are high enough that you've got absolute privacy and it's so it's so private and and peaceful there's no motorway noise there's no road noise there's no railways it's just so peaceful and when you stood out the back with the sun coming around south facing you you, you feel like you could be anywhere in the world yeah i mean so just just bef before we wrap up then it be, could be interesting to know a little bit about your business kind of moving forward and what what other projects you're working on and kind of yeah what you're what you're looking to do moving forward i think um working nearly three years on this project obviously put my life and soul into it and learned so many lessons because that's what we do as humans we're constantly learning aren't we and i think if anyone ever says you do something you don't it's just it's a lie there's so many things that i learned on this project about how to deliver a high-end luxury home uh, efficiently and practically as possible that I've utilized that ex this experience of building this house to create my own company with my own model of just being able to design and deliver luxury properties to the exact same standard but having integrity being open but with the client and honest about the profit margins what's being spent where, who gets paid what. Client has a bank statement every month. They see every single penny. So if you're a high net worth and you want a five, six, ten million pound house designing, you know every single penny you are spending is value for money. You know where your money's going. There's no one on that building site that is pulling the wool over your eyes to try and conceal a profit. And you know that everyone on that site has aligned goals to achieve perfection. So this is this is the model, the business, the company that I've got now designing, building um, this second ultra modern super home, but utilizing all the um, experiences I had in the three years of building South Lodge. Wow. Cool. 
And you got any other questions? No, I think that's. Yeah, I mean, I'm, we're 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 blown away by the property. We can we can tell that your life, yeah, your soul has gone into it. I mean, for those that are listening to this, we'll definitely have a full kind of um, short film again showing the property in more detail. So we'll link that in the description. But thank you for sitting down with us, and we'll link your Instagram, your website below, and any of the social medias. So then we'll also get in contact with you with any big projects. They know where to go. Absolutely. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much.